about a year ago that Baxter announced that they were getting out of the cryocyte biz business or the, the freeze bag business. And so many of us started scrambling um, to figure out what we were going to do to replace it. And so when we had this opportunity to talk, and so I think Origin and a number of companies have been asked, okay, how do you go through validation? And so they asked us to put together a session on validating new uh, cryo bags. And so that's what we've done. We've tried to do three different perspectives, one from a cord blood bank, one from um, our center, and then one, uh, one person who has done multiple validations at multiple sites. And so I think it should be very interesting, and hopefully you'll learn quite a bit from it. And so today our first speaker is going to be Donna Reagan. Um, Donna Reagan is the executive director of the St. Louis Cord Blood Bank, and her talk is Ask and You Will Receive, Working with Industry to Develop New Products for Cord Blood Manufacturing. Donna? Good morning, um, by the looks of people who are here. There is an interest in this topic for, for a variety of reasons. And what I'm going to talk about today can be applied to a number of things, but um, we're going to be really specific today about, about the cryo bags. Okay. So Left. Yeah, it's not. Okay, I well, I can do job. that too. <laughs> oh, go ahead, if you like. Um, so the alternative title for my talk could be, Be Persistent and Sometimes You'll Get What You Need. And this can apply to both uh, uh, products, devices, assays, methodologies. There's a number of working groups right now. Um, you know, we're always looking for new assays to characterize our products. We're looking for new products to, to make manufacturing better and cell therapy products better for our patients. And it applies to cellular therapy, cord blood products, whatever. I'm going to make several disclaimers here. First of all, we're going to be discussing commercial products by name. Um, it just makes it easier that way. I found if I tried to make it too generic, it just didn't work for me. It would be confusing, I think, in the presentation. So none of these speakers have any commercial interests in the products we're going to talk about today or the companies discussed. We're describing real life experiences, so this is kind of a reality show. Um, pres presentation should not be interpreted as showing favoritism to anybody, and on the other hand, any challenges we might have had with products or with companies should not reflect on their business practices. Okay, we got that all out of the way. So um, I'm going to convey some background history demonstrating a need for a new product and the relationship between vendors and customers and illustrate the course of customization, prototype testing, comparability evaluation, and the impact on our processes. And you can look to your colleagues for some of the answers to these questions sometimes. We have a lot of information and, and I have to admit I'm really proud to be in a field where people do collaborate. Okay. So we all know that the use of vendor, uh, backup vendors and backup products is not only uh, a good practice, but also uh, it's, a, it's a regulation because there are lots of things you never know when a product is going to be back ordered or when it's going to be recalled or discontinued. Uh, we're in a very specialized industry. A lot of times there isn't always a product, uh, more than one product for what we use, and we know that we're kind of a niche industry, so there's not um, oftentimes multiple products. You know, I go to my purchasing department and I, I, I ask about a product and they say, give me three bids. Well, there aren't always three vendors to go to. Um, I'm going to use the example of the cryocyte bag. Um, it was the exclusive product, at least in, in our practices, for a long, long time, and in 2003, there was an article published in Cytotherapy describing catastrophic failures of freezing bags. And because of all of the negative press that it brought to Baxter, they decided they were going to take it off the market. And several of us didn't have anything to back it up with and were kind of in a panic situation. Um, so, you know, they brought the, the product back to the market and all was well for a little while. Um, but we still recognized the need to have some other vendors make a product for us that was comparable. 
Then in March of 29, uh, Baxter announced in a letter that they were discontinuing the sales of these products, and then everybody got interested again um, acutely in finding products for these, uh, a replacement for these products. So I'm going to go back even further and say that a lot of the techs that work in cord blood banks and cell therapy labs may have transfusion medicine backgrounds. They were techs working in the blood banks and were very familiar with product bags that had pigtails on them, and we use those pigtails to verify ABO. So cord blood products and cryopreservation bags, we started keeping segments from the very beginning because we were all blood bankers and we said, well, of course, we've got to keep these things on there. But we were even questioned by very reputable people who came to visit us back in the mid-90s, why are you keeping the segments? You're wasting cells that way. We're like, well, we know it's going to be representative of the product and the same interpretation that was used in the blood banks, we want to verify identity. But why isn't that cryo label uh, or cryo bag tubing labeled um, much like it was in the in the blood banks so we requested modifications and we requested and we requested and um, it just wasn't uh, worth it to the company to invest in uh, modifying the product for us so then in 2003 um, McCullough and the Minnesota group published um, an observation that they had on day of infusion where the product they were lucky enough to have the resources to do uh, a quick HLA type and found that the product HLA type the testing that they had did not match the information that they had and um, in that case there wasn't a segment attached to the bag it was uh, performed on uh, an ancillary sample and the, the product wasn't what they thought it was and they had to scramble at the last minute to find a replacement product but it really brought to light the necessity to have something a better source for identity testing and um, while AABB and Netcord Fact had suggested people use SEGS before that, the regulation became a little stricter, and they then required integral segments on products. So if you know you need something and you've got some ideas, don't be afraid to ask, and you keep asking if you have to, and you scramble around on the vendor floor. That's exactly how I ran across Richard and said, and he was... There were many people I had asked about this customization, and he was the first. I was said, can you do this? And he said, yeah, I think we can. I was, that would be awesome. So we knew what we wanted, and we had to mark up some designs, and we talked back and forth about how this was going to look. The main thing we were interested in was a comparable product that didn't change our process too much, but had these labeled segments with a unique identifier that absolutely linked the cord blood product to that segment that we wanted to use for identity. And then we thought, you know, it might be great instead of having variable segs and everybody's looking for consistency if we had sealer marks on there so that the text knew exactly where to make the weld to create these segments. So again, we wanted to look at the size of the bag. Is it something we could just drop into the cassettes and not have to change the configuration of our product inventory? Uh, where are the ports? How many of them did we need? Where did we want them placed? And what kind of covers did they use on them? And at the same time, we became aware that this, we knew overwrap was out there. We didn't do it. We um, uh, decided, though, that maybe we should look into this at the same time. So I did uh, a number of surveys from my colleagues, and uh, Sue Patchen in Dallas was nice enough to give me her procedure and her overwrap and her heat sealers and um, heat sealer designs, and, and it was really helpful. But we had to make, you know, there were lots of people who said, well, you can use 10 cent bags out there. You know, they'll work just fine. And then, but I realized, too, a lot of people were storing in vapor. So we had to find something, since we stored in liquid, that was certified for use in liquid nitrogen. Um, and then, of course, we had to look at different heat sealers and find out what worked there. Couldn't use the same one we were using for the tube sealer, so. One of the things you want to look for during your vendor qualification is their certification. Are they qualified to make these products for you? Do they have approval by the agencies um, that look for quality systems, whether that be ISO or, or the EC? And I want to clarify here, too, that um, FDA doesn't necessarily clear all products or approve all, they clear products. They don't approve all products. So like in this case, too, the um, uh, substantially equivalent 510K device just means that it's comparable to something that's already out there on the market, and it permits the device to proceed to market, but it doesn't necessarily mean it has FDA approval. So part one of our validation, we just wanted to ensure the consistency of the materials and the supplies we used um, and make sure that they limited deterioration and uh, optimized 
stability, prevented damage, avoid cross-contamination. And the conclusion of this activity would result in either having the origin bag be our primary or secondary cryopreservation <coughs> bag, and that the overwrap was effective in um, uh, keeping cross-contamination at a minimum or eliminating it completely. So we challenged the system in a number of different ways. The limits of the procedure, we wanted to use the same equipment, the same processes, the same personnel that we used in our routine processes every day. Test the sturdiness of the bag by subjecting it to the lowest temperature that uh, the laboratory would have presented, and that, of course, being liquid nitrogen at minus 196. The integrity of the bag by overfilling and underfilling it to see um, how it worked under those conditions. The durability of the bag by taking it from those very cold temperatures to the warmer temperatures of the water bath. And the stability of the whole process by subjecting the bags to multiple freeze-thaw cycles. With the overwrap and the sealer validation, we wanted to see if the bag was capable of protecting that primary container under liquid nitrogen conditions. Also, uh, how well did the heat sealer work on the plastics that we're going to be using? Verify the durability of the seals that were created by that bag sealer, and then we used both uh, the Baxter and the Origin bag for the overwrap, knowing that if we used one and then backed up with the other, um, that the overwrap would work with either case. So the specifications that we were looking for in a bag of the intended use, of course, cryopreserving our cord blood components. We were looking for approval or clearance by the FDA because those are the, obviously you're going to prioritize those products when you're working under um, a regulated environment. Uh, we wanted to be aware of the construction of the bag and the plastics, not necessarily know all the uh, proprietary stuff, but we needed to be aware of what the construction was and the rating of the bag. Was it rated to be immersed in liquid nitrogen or not? Then was it a drop-in product for us? Could we just replace what we were already using and not have to change our product uh, management configuration? Look at the physical characteristics like we talked about before, and we were also working on needle-free processing at that time too, so that was very important to us and the labeling pocket to have something affixed to the product that would identify it. And latex-free, of course, was important. Um, but most important, what we were after, was the integrally attached tubing segment that would contain material that was the same as what was in that product bag that we could use for identity and eventually potency. Uh, that unique identifier would link the product to the attached sags and, of course, have the sealing marks. The materials we used in the vendor or, I'm sorry, in the uh, validation was the origin bag, the Baxter bag, the origin overwrap bags, because they were the ones that we found were certified for use in liquid nitrogen. The same metal cassettes we always used. Then we, um, we got uh, Sue Patchen's uh, recommendation on the impulse hand sealer. And we used a Dextran, um, it's a Dextran, not Gentran in this slide, DMSO freezing cocktail that we tinged with Tripan Blue so that if there was some errors um, uh, or some problems with the integrity of the bag, we didn't contaminate our entire liquid nitrogen freezers. We used control rate freezing, liquid nitrogen storage vessels in a water bath. Um, on the fill part of the procedure, we prepared that solution and tinged it with the Tripan Blue. We selected nine of each of the bags and recorded the manufacturer and lot number. We inserted labels into the pouch and we filled three bags at where we um, normally saw our fill volumes to be. Then we put in, uh, we tested by overfilling at 48 mLs and we tested to underfill them at about 16 mLs. And then the wrap and freeze part of the validation enclosed them in the appropriately sized bags. So we had big bags and little bags. So we did this with both the 50 and the 250 mil bags. Um, sealed the, with the bag sealer. Make sure that it fit in the bag, the product fit in the bag. Um, okay, let me start over. The bag fit in the overwrap and that when it was overwrapped, it fit in the cassette because it can be pretty tight. Inspect the quality of the seal and then freeze the bags according to our SOP. We transferred the bags to liquid nitrogen and stored them overnight. The next day, removed the bags from the freezer whenever we had time. Inspected the seal and all of these results are documented, initialed, and dated as they were done. Looking, for over, uh, looking at the overwrap bag for cracks. And I will say that during, during a lot of this phase, we were not really good at getting the air out of the overwrap bags. So uh, we did have a number of cracks in those instances, but we knew that was operator error and not necessarily bag failure. 
Um, and also, we knew that at that point, if you were going to be taking a product, uh, a bag out to get the segment off anyway during regular processing, you were going to be violating the overwrap anyway. So, and then removing the overwrap bag and um, documenting any difficulty that we might have had taking it off. So for the thaw part portion, we inserted the bag into a biohazard or a clean bag and put it in 37 degree water bath, observing for leakage of fluid, loss of the protected cover, and the ability to read the information that we had put on the label. Again, documentation was very important, sign and date each entry. Uh, we at that point, if there were any bags that would have had a failure, we would have removed them from the process and then repeat um, the freeze and thaw process for four cycles with the bags that were maintained throughout. There was a couple of limitations to this. The purpose of the validation was really about the integrity of the product itself. It wasn't to test cellular um, viability, potency, integrity. It was just about the, um, the product performance. And then, like I said before, we filled it with cryoprotectant so we didn't contaminate our LN2 stores. So I, I just want to make a note here for cryopreservation bags, um, and we have to talk about this in our training. The 50 mil bags is really a nominal volume. The recommended volume for those is 10 to 20, and for the 250 mil bags, it's 30 to 70. So um, that can be confusing to new techs coming in and playing with these bags. Um, these recommendations are based on freezing the product in a horizontal position. And you can achieve the best results if you have uniform thickness of the fluid that's contained inside the bag. We routinely exceed the max volume, but we've done this since the beginning of time and we really don't have any incidences. The two bag breakages that we have, we've identified that there was air in the bag and the rapid expansion taking them out of the freezer uh, was what the culprit was. So this is what our uh, validation record looks like and I'm gonna highlight the top part Um, by telling you that all of the instrumentation that was used in validation, we wanted to make sure all of those records were up to date. So the actual tube sealers that we used, make sure their validation was done. The freezer records were reviewed and they were acceptable. The control rate uh, freezer performance was good and the water bath records were all up to date and ready to go. And then on the second part of this is where we got into the bags uh, specifics. You can see the lot numbers and uh, manufacturer, fill dates, did the bag fit comfortably, everybody had to make an objective conclusion for all of those pieces and then the four freeze dates are documented here as you can see. On page two of this, um, we'll blow up that first column so you can see exactly what was there. And here we have documented the date of thaw and inspection and the evaluation of the seals, the integrity, the ease of removal, and then the bag products, uh, bag performance as well. Okay, so on the second part then, after we decided that the bags, okay, were good and we were going to consider using them, we wanted to evaluate the impact of the bag on the cellular integrity, potency, and recovery. Um, again, the conclusion was that we wanted to either uh, use this bag as our primary or secondary vendor. So we took umbilical cord blood products that we got into the bank that did not meet our criteria for um, routine banking. And we get plenty of products, so this really is, uh, we're actually very lucky that we have resource material like this. But we wanted them to be comparable to the products that we do bank because we wanted to eliminate a variable in that case. So the products had to be less than 48 hours old that didn't meet our TNC requirements. And we didn't manipulate the product like we normally do, a red cell and plasma depletion, because we wanted to split the the cord blood into each a Baxter bag and an origin bag so that we had comparable products in each of the bags. So the only exception there was when we had a really large bag that for some other reason was deferred that we could use and then we could process it regularly and split it between the two bags. Um, cryo preserved and thawed these according to the um, routine procedure in the St. Louis cord blood bank and which is a manual RBC reduction and plasma depletion, and then we thawed these products with our reconstitutive or the uh, dilution method. So we took post-processing or pre-freeze values and post-thaw testing to establish our TNCs, the regular characteristics that you would look for, and we compared 
the Baxter versus the Origin products, and the attached segments on each of those, um, just to see if they compared with one another. Again, the limitation here was we could introduce a variable by, by splitting the products and having a little bit lower volumes, but we figured it was the most practical way and the most uh, relevant way to do this validation. We compared the, the bags between bags rather than um, necessarily the recovers, recoveries when we looked for the comparison between the two products. And then uh, the small sample size might be limiting too. So the results, the origin bags were inspected after removal. Everything was considered acceptable. All the sterility testing was negative on all the products. We calculated the, um, uh, the characteristics and found that they were not statistically significantly different from each other and that the segments exhibited the same or comparable results as the unit. Here is the um, origin bag TNC recoveries from post-processing and post-thaw. So I actually did want this, thanks. So the blue line represents the post-processing TNCs. And as you can see, you expect a little bit of lo a loss post-thaw. And uh, you can see how that performed very well. On the next graph, we see the CFU recoveries. On the blue line, again, we have post-processing CFU, then we have uh, post-thaw CFU, and the yellow line is the segment CFU. So they trace each other fairly well. We never expected them to be exactly the same, but not statistically significantly different. So then we looked at the Baxter bag and compared it with the Origin bag, and you can see they overlap each other very nicely. The CD34, you see a similar trend, and the CFU as well. Segment CFU comparisons on the two were similar. Not identical, you wouldn't expect that, but similar. So again, there was no statistical significance between the product characteristics and the bag was intact in all cases, the seams, the pouch, the segments, uh, we could read everything and we had negative sterility testing. So we decided to accept these as either the primary or the secondary product that we used in crowd preserving and storing our products. But since they also had this unique feature for which we entered this activity, um, they actually had uh, four segments that we could make on a product. We decided to go ahead and just use three of those. Um, but now we're going to use four since uh, the reserve sample is uh, FDA is looking to the segment to be that reserve sample that they describe in the licensure document. But because uh, the, they're labeled, there's a 100% unmistakable match of the product to the segment. And so for that reason, we wanted Origin to be our primary vendor. So we began using the bag in January of 2008, and we, we talked to Origin about some issues that we had with the spiking port. And uh, we shipped our first unit that was processed in the, cryo, in the uh, origin bag. And we went ahead and gave them a plasma transfer set to spike that because we found those to be more successful than the regular um, sampling site couplers that we had traditionally been using. In um, July 2008, origin started working on the bag serial numbers and released, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but released that product in March of 2010 along with the needleless injection port, which we like too. And then June 2010, they announced that this, uh, this extended protective tubing collar that's inside, which was really intended to keep the bag safe from a U spiking through it, um, but people were finding diff difficult to use, that that's being shortened, and that should improve access and recovery, because you can tell you might have some cellular material that gets uh, left in that area, and you want to make sure that you can get all the cells out that you possibly can. Um, uh, people were asking us for our validation procedure quite a bit, and um, because of the Baxter recall, some groups in AABB and ISCT got to work and came up with some resources that are available. AABBs are available to members <coughs> only, but there are points to consider. Process validation outlines and a validation sample, and ISCT also had three different va uh, validation templates. I mean, uh, telegraphed in 2006, Jolyn Proctor had asked Herb Cullis to um, write an article in Tech Talk about uh, bag validation, which he, he kindly agreed to do, and that is also published in the 2006 Telegraphed Tech Talk column. 
So the moral of my story is ask. You know, sometimes you can get what you need. Um, working with cooperative vendors can, you know, working together can get you the products that you need, and ultimately we can make better cell therapies for the patients that we serve. Are we gonna take questions now or later? At the end. At the end. Very good, thank you.